I hope that uh, uh, I'll be able to uh, share with you this morning uh, some of the work that we've been doing over the last many years, uh, trying to better understand the impact of uh, HIV treatment on preventing morbidity, mortality, and HIV transmission. Uh, and let me just emphasize, uh, uh, this is a package deal. Uh, we, we get the three of them uh, for the one intervention uh, that uh, is so crucial to the life of the people that we're trying to uh, help with. I'm going to tell you the story, how this came about, uh, because uh, uh, we need to set the record straight in terms of how we came about with this thinking and how the monitoring and evaluation of this impl uh, the implementation of this strategy uh, has evolved. Um, uh, most of you, uh, uh, in fact, many of you probably don't remember because you're too young, but uh, some of us do remember uh, the days when that red line that you see here was going up and up and up, and uh, uh, much as the Casey House and the Dr. Peter Center, uh, we did not know what the future was going to look like uh, for us. Um, uh, uh, Peter Jepson Young uh, was an inspiration for us, and as you know, he had multiple complications, and, uh, and we struggled uh, trying to find a adequate support uh, for him and for many like him uh, at a very devastating time in the history of the epidemic. Uh, in 1994, we were honestly uh, planning a new epidemic of blindness due to CMB retinitis in the city of Vancouver uh, among young gay men, uh, and that fortunately never materialized. And the reason why it never materialized, coincidentally, uh, was because of some of the work that we and others were doing, but ultimately matured in Vancouver in 1996. Uh, three pieces of work uh, came together. One, John Mellor's uh, uh, clear demonstration that uh, viral load predicts outcomes in HIV disease. The second one, uh, Trip Gulick's Merco 3.5 study showing that triple therapy with a protein inhibitor uh, could suppress viral replication. And the third one, a piece that I was uh, leading at the time, uh, the, uh, similar to the Merco 3.5, the INCAS trial that showed that triple therapy with a neverapine, an NNRTI, uh, could similarly stop uh, viral replication. These were phase two studies. And because of the urgency at the time, uh, a group of us got together, drafted a bunch of guidelines, uh, put them out uh, at the Vancouver Conference in 1996, and a year or two before the papers were even published, uh, we actually implemented those guidelines. Uh, we were criticized, there was a lot of controversy, uh, but Vancouver, which we were hoping would become One World, One Hope, actually crystallized itself as the hope, because immediately thereafter, death rate uh, decreased dramatically, and life expectancy increased markedly. And it continues to increase, as you know, we recently published our most recent estimates uh, and continue to be very, very optimistic. Um, there is a reason why I tell you this story. Uh, is because uh, in 1996, there was a sense of urgency. Uh, today, uh, there is a, a, a huge degree of apathy that is making it very difficult for us to uh, take this discovery to the next level. And people are happy to continue to ask for the next level of evidence when actually I'm going to show you all of the necessary evidence is in. And uh, what we are lacking is political leadership to implement what we know it works and to do it effectively and to do it now. So let me move on. In 1996, we implemented treatment for people who were fairly advanced in the disease with triple therapy. And unexpectedly, because we didn't plan it this way, we saw that HIV new infections suddenly decreased in British Columbia at a time in which syphilis was actually rising. So we could not attribute the change in HIV incidents or new cases uh, to the fact that sexual behavior somehow had been modified uh, in a favorable way. And the only way we could explain this is if HIV uh, infected individuals were rendered uh, at least partially non-infectious uh, by using antiretroviral therapy. Now, uh, at that time, this was sacrilegious, and we could not even uh, start uh, uh, vocalizing those ideas. But by 2006, we did. But I'm going to tell you the true story, how we came about, or, or where we actually uh, were able to get the courage to go forward with this. Um, in the uh, early 2000s, uh, I received a call from the Deputy uh, of Health in the province of British Columbia, a friend of mine, um, who will remain unnamed, and remains a friend, by the way, uh, 
Uh, she said to me, uh, uh, Julio, do you realize that your program's budget, which is the, the antiretroviral therapy program for the, for the province, has increased 25% per year over the last three years? And I said, yes, I do. Uh, and have you realized that death is down, that transmission is down, morbidity is down, hospitalizations are down? I said, no, no, but I understand that, Julio. Uh, believe me, I, I, I follow this very closely. But at 25% per year, uh, uh, you know, we, we may not be able to afford this. Uh, we're thinking about putting quotas in the number of people that you can actually treat. And I said, well, with all due respect, that's crazy. Uh, we have preliminary data that suggests that not only the treatment is essential for the life of people infected with HIV, but if you uh, restrain our ability to treat people, uh, you are going to increase the number of people who are highly infectious in the community, and therefore the epidemic is going to be worse. So why don't you go and talk to the public health people, tell them to fix their act, uh, stop the epidemic, and the day they stop the epidemic, we're going to stop treating people. And she didn't like that. Uh, <laughs> but, but she said, uh, okay, uh, uh, you know, I've been following the literature for some time uh, in this area. I have never seen something like that. If you, if you can actually mount an, an argument and document it, uh, we may have another conversation. And so in 2005, I, I realigned all of the resources of the center to actually do the necessary work with the data that we had uh, to uh, give a body of evidence to support what we already knew was happening, which was that treatment was decreasing transmission. And I'm telling you this story because a lot of people in the community are trying to create a notion that we got involved in treatment and prevention because we wanted to stop an epidemic. And the truth is that we got involved in treatment and prevention because we realized that by demonstrating that treatment can prevent transmission, the return on the investment was so huge that our public health officials would not have a way to stopping me from offering my patients the best possible treatment for their benefit and ultimately for a public health benefit. So the hypothesis was ultimately presented at the Toronto International Conference. Many of you will remember uh, it was rather controversial at the time. Uh, despite the fact that it was very straightforward and, uh, and it follows every principle of infectious diseases. The treatment stops the replication of the virus. The virus becomes undetectable in the blood. The immune system recovers and the individual, therefore, is going to have a healthy uh, life ahead of uh, himself or herself. At the same time, uh, the same reduction of viral load uh, and undetectability of the virus uh, becomes a fact in every other body fluid, including sexual fluids. And therefore, if we always knew that more virus in a biological fluid was associated with an increased efficiency of transmission, uh, you didn't need a mathematician to tell you that the opposite should be correct. And so we basically argue that this would lead to a sharp reduction of HIV transmission. I went on to my friend and collaborator, uh, uh, Dr. Bob Hogg, who is a demographer. Uh, I offered him all of the fundamentals that we had available at the time. And I said, well, I want you to uh, create a demographic model, a hypothetical demographic model. This is hypothetical because it cannot be done. The only computer can do it, uh, uh, which would uh, evaluate what would be the impact, for example, in this case for South Africa, if instead of treating the 30% of people, the tail end of the epidemic, so, so those that were sick or about to get sick, if we were to offer and treat everybody that was infected with HIV. And very quickly became apparent that uh, HIV prevalence, when you treat all, uh, basically disappears. The number of infections prevented shown in the panel below uh, is in the millions. Uh, and the cost, of course, the cost is going to be higher in the short term. The upfront cost is significant. But for the first time, we had data that suggested that this strategy would be actually cost saving. You will save money if you actually invest more on uh, seeking uh, an engagement and engaging and actually offering treatment to people infected with HIV. And because it's cost averting, this opened the door for us to enhance our programs, to maximize our impact upfront, and therefore control the epidemic. With those data, it took a few years, but with those data, uh, I eventually managed to get all the way to Gordon Campbell, my premier at the time. And uh, a lesson to be learned is that time spent with the bureaucrats is not time well spent. <laughs> you had to go to the top. And only when I got to the top, within the first 10 minutes of me showing uh, uh, Gordon Campbell's slides, he looked at me and almost shouting, he said, why are we not doing this yet? <laughs> and I said, Mr. Premier, because your government has not allowed me to do it. 
And they said, well, I want you to do this. And I said, well, let's do it together. Uh, so what you see here is the three phases of expansion of antiretroviral therapy in British Columbia. The first one following 1996, according to contemporary guidelines. The second one, the controversial era of the treatment interruptions, uh, which came to an end in 2003. By 2003 is when I get the call from my deputy minister, and by 2004, uh, uh, we were able to um, escape her influence, move on to Gordon Campbell, and therefore we have been in, a, in an expansion mode ever since, in, including to the present day. And what does that do to mortality? Uh, you can see it here. This is a reciprocal uh, uh, shape, if you want, for the mortality curve whereby you see that even with the later expansion, we see a further decrease in mortality, uh, now to levels that are barely there. We used to have one patient dying from AIDS in 1995 in St. Paul's Hospital. Uh, uh, that was a, a routine. It was devastating. Today, my residents don't really know uh, what that looks like uh, because we just don't see not only mortality from AIDS, but morbidity, as you see here. In fact, I think I have a better slide. This slide actually captures all cases ever diagnosed with AIDS in the province of British Columbia. It's new data. It's still in preparation. Uh, we use three different uh, methods to capture the data, or four methods, I forget. And, and the, the bottom line is that it doesn't really matter how you count them. Uh, they're all doing the same thing. Uh, the epidemic started in 1983 in BC. It peaked in the mid-90s. Uh, dual therapy um, sort of slowed things down a little bit in the mid-90s, but it wasn't until 1996 when we had uh, triple therapy that, 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 that the curve took a plunge. And notice that in the latter years, uh, 2005 and thereafter, uh, we see a marked decrease again because of the re-expansion of the program. So when people say, is, is, is it worth being more aggressive with the roller antiretroviral therapy in terms of morbidity and mortality, I, see, I think that these data at the populational level clearly demonstrates that there is lots to be gained at the individual level as well. British Columbia has low TB rates. We never expected to see an association between uh, antiretroviral therapy expansion and tuberculosis rates. And yet, even there, we're able to see this association, which, of course, is much, much more dramatic uh, in Africa than it is in BC. Uh, but this goes to show that there are multiple other levels where antiretroviral therapy is having a beneficial effect in morbidity, mortality, and equally important, uh, in transmission. The vertical transmission of HIV in British Columbia has been eliminated or virtually eliminated. We have had two cases of HIV transmission in the last 10 years, uh, and in both cases uh, that occurred because the, the, the mother was not identified as HIV positive until late into the labor process. So uh, it was a system failure. It's not a, a failure of the strategy. Uh, unfortunately, this is likely to happen uh, sporadically, but, but, but the tools that we have clearly demonstrate that vertical transmission of HIV can and it should be eliminated. And what about HIV transmission from all other causes? Well, here I put together for you the three phases of expansion of antiretroviral therapy. The number of people on treatment is on the blue. The number of infections is on the red. Uh, uh, you tell me if you need a statistician to, to, to show you that these curves are significantly associated. There you go. There you go. We have updated those curves, uh, and as you see here, uh, the trends continue. Uh, this uh, data is as recent as 2012. Uh, the 2013 data is not yet out. What you see here, in addition, on the uh, light blue line on the bottom, is new HIV diagnosis among HIV, if, sorry, among injection drug users. Uh, I remind you that some of my colleagues, particularly in the United States, have long argued that injection drug users are very uh, unlikely to benefit from treatment for a variety of reasons that you will understand. Uh, in BC, we have had a very aggressive approach uh, to harm reduction programs, all the way from supervised injection site uh, to medicalized heroin and the likes. Uh, uh, and uh, as a result of that, uh, we've been able to engage in a sustainable fashion injection drug users productively over the years. And uh, we have published separately the benefit that this has had in terms of morbidity, mortality related to HIV, but also related to overdoses. Uh, but in addition, uh, I'm showing you a greater than 90% reduction uh, in the number of new infections in injection drug uses in Vancouver. 
I have not added here data regarding treatment of prevention in MSM, uh, men who have sex with men. And I'm sure that that question is going to come up, so let me address that right away. Uh, there is an epidemic of uh, HIV and MSM that is not as effectively contained by treatment of prevention at the present time as it is for the injection drug users. And the reason for that, in my mind, is fairly simple. It's not that the treatment doesn't work, is that the networks uh, 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 operate in a different way. And so what happens is that uh, because uh, we have adequate harm reduction strategies for injection drug users, namely uh, clean needles, uh, super injection site, um, uh, so on and so forth, uh, uh, then, then the treatment of prevention together with these initiatives works very efficiently to reduce HIV transmission. In the case of sexual transmission in any setting, uh, really uh, all we have to offer is condoms. And I don't need to tell you that I don't like them and my patients don't like it either. So condoms are used sporadically. And if we don't accept that fact, if we don't get real about it, uh, then we're not going to be able to understand why our programs are not working well. Uh, if we continue to pretend that condoms are going to be the solution for this, I hate to tell you, but sure, they should be there, they should be available, and we should encourage people to use them. But not, let's not delude ourselves that, that condoms are going to ever be used 100% of the time by 100% of the people in 100% of the circumstances. So because of the dynamics of the epidemic, and that's all I need to say, the situation is very challenging for MSM because really all we have is either change of behavior or um, uh, 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 treatment of prevention. And treatment of prevention by itself will not have a full impact until all of the MSM uh, who are HIV positive are, are on treatment. And so the threshold that we need to reach is much higher. The, the number of new infections in MSM in British Columbia has declined slightly over the last several years. Uh, that by itself is extremely encouraging because the underlying epidemic of syphilis in British Columbia has done this. And so what that's saying is that there is a differential uh, uh, penetration of syphilis and HIV, which continues to be dri driven by a protective effect of treatment prevention. So we don't need more uh, questions. We need more answers. But at the same time, we need more people to engage in treatment if we're going to stop HIV in that community. Uh, I wanted to reassure you that we find less HIV despite the fact that we test more in the province. So uh, this is to reassure you that we're making a huge effort to find new people, uh, a new diagnosis, and yet we're finding less and less and less. 